you for tuning in again tonight. We have something really good for a hot topic in the news this week. This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Well, it's after that holiday weekend, and hopefully everybody's ready to get back to work until Christmas. We have another exciting show planned for you tonight. We're going to talk about a man who was charged with raping a teenager. He said he didn't do it, and I believed him, and I fought very hard for him. It's very difficult to talk about rape, especially when it has to do with a teenager or a child. But we're going to deal with some of those very sensitive issues tonight. You will have an opportunity, as always, to call in. One of the reasons why I think this topic is interesting is because I get about five calls a week about people or family members who call and say, my son, my husband, my brother was falsely accused of rape. He's been in prison. He's just getting out. And uh, it's a very sensitive subject, but it's a real subject. I even had a man tell me today that he just had a friend or an acquaintance of his that got out of prison after 33 years in being in prison for a crime he did not commit. Um, so we're going to talk about that tonight. And in the studio, I have Michael Odoms. And uh, thank you, Michael, for being courageous enough to come in and tell your story. And then I also have uh, my investigator, my private investigator, Sonia Rafit. And she's going to answer investigative questions that you might have, and particularly about this case. So we're going to go straight into it. We're going to analyze it. We're going to talk about the Harris County criminal justice system. Hopefully, we'll enlighten you and educate you about the way the process works. And remember, this is an educational show. I don't mean to demean anybody or any victim of a crime, of rape. I know it happens. Um, I was a young girl that's had negative things happen to me in those regards. So uh, do understand that we are sensitive to this topic, but we also want to explain situations where children might have a motive to lie. So, Michael, let's go straight into it. So thank you for being courageous enough to tell your story. Yeah. And uh, please take about five minutes and just tell us what happened to you. Well, I was accused of raping a... She's not like a family member, but she was like 15 years old, and uh, she said I, I burned her with cigarettes and all kinds of stuff like that, and, you know, it just wasn't true, and I was supposed, I was asleep the, the day that it's supposed to happen. The whole day is supposed to happen. I was asleep the whole day, and I woke up uh, one time, took somebody to the store, came home, ate dinner, and went back to sleep. And how it happened, I, I could have been asleep, but I doubt it because when I'm asleep, I sleep hard. And are you and, one of those people that has like sleep apnea yes. or make a lot of noise? Okay. Yes, I can. Oh, I can clear the room. Okay. <laughs> and you room. lived in a household with how many people? Uh, it was about seven, eight people that stayed there. It was a lot of people. A lot and of a people. small house. How many bedrooms? Four. Okay. Four bedrooms. Four bedroom house. Mm -hmm. Okay, and. Um, Let's just call people, I don't want to call people's names uh, to protect their identity, but let's just to call them in the household you lived in. You can call people like Pops or Grandpa or Aunt and Uncle or Brother to the Aunt or something like that. So, okay. uh, so who, uh, Pops owned the house, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and then, so that's the oldest person in yes, the household. And then who else lived in that house? Uh, Did any of his children live in that house? Yes, ma'am. He had a son that stayed there. Uh, Two grand, two grandsons that stayed there, and we had uh, it was a couple of friends that had stayed there because they needed somewhere to live too. So, so what was the sleeping arrangement? Well, I had my own room with my baby mama. You know, we still uh, her uh, grandfather is pop, so okay. we had our own room. Uh, the two friends had their own room. Pops had his room. 
and uh, Pop's son had his room. What about Pop's other son? They they was all in a room together, all three of them. So, so the two sons and the girlfriend? Girlfriend. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, all right. Um, so what else happened after that? Uh, the detective came out, and they took, like, sheets and a whole bunch of other items out of my room, and I gave him permission to take it. Um, and he asked me, was I willing to take a polygraph or whatever, and I told him, yeah. Um, and I didn't take a polygraph until maybe like a month, two months later, and then I woke up one morning, and the police was at the door. Like, How did that later. make you feel? I felt like crap. I felt like... You know, I've never been in any kind of trouble, so, you know. How old are you? 30. And uh, it kind of made me feel. So tell me how it happened. So they banged on the door. Was it daytime or no, nighttime? No, I, uh, I got up to go check on my truck, to go warm my truck up to get ready to go to work. And I turned around, was walking back in the house to go grab whatever else I needed. And when I got to the front door, the police just came and ran up on me out of nowhere. Jumped the back gate. Was it day or night? It was daytime. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. All right. 10 in the morning. So they jumped the back gate, they came in on you, and then what happened? They they, they didn't go throw me to the ground, but he slammed me on the car. He told me I was under arrest because I was I, I raped somebody, and they put me in the car. They took me to Pasadena jail, and I was transferred to the county. And so that's the day you were arrested? Yes, ma'am. Now, what about the day that they questioned you? Hadn't they questioned you before that? It was maybe some months before that. Right. Like, maybe two months. And how did that come about? Did they, like, invite you in, or did you, did they come and arrest you to bring you in? Well, they how came, they all came to the house the, the same day that it was supposed to happen. And, well, when they came to, well, when she made the accusations, uh, and, you know, the detective sat down at the table, he just asked me, you know, did I do it, or... Whatever, and I told him, you know, no, I didn't because how can I do it? And I was sleep the whole day, and he was like, well, if you didn't do it, are you willing to take a polygraph? And I told him, yeah. So how many times did he question you that day, the day that the, the allegation was made? Just once, okay. just once that day. At your house? At the house, yes, ma'am. Okay, so when were the uh, statements that you made to the police done that are that are on video? That may have been maybe two months later. So that was when they actually arrested you? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you were actually under arrest. Okay. Um, now, in that two-month time, when they first questioned you and when you were arrested, did you still have contact with this uh, young girl? We'll call her Mary. I mean, yeah, she came by the house, like, every day. Because that's her grandfather's house, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. She came, like, every day. And, you know, when she come, I'll try to leave or whatever. Or, you know, to make everything better, I moved out the house to the little house in the back. Mm -hmm. And she even came you know, as far as to the backyard to knock on the door to ask me to take her somewhere. Right. And I just didn't answer the door or nothing, just looked at her like, are you serious? Right. Okay. Well, that's interesting. All right, so um, let's talk more about um, the process. So you get arrested in November of 2010, mm -hmm. and um, tell us about the arrest process. Now, you were arrested. How long did it take for you to get to court while in jail? Well, it, uh, 24 hours later, I was out. My mom and dad had bonded me out. So. And you had a 20 or $30,000 bond? Yes, ma'am. Which one was it? Do you remember? I think it was 20. Okay. 20. And uh, the court date, I got out Saturday, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and I had to go to court on Monday, the next Monday. And so tell me what you did. Uh, what did you expect when you went to court? Tell me about that experience. Well, it was my first time, so I kind of really didn't know what to expect. I mean, I didn't know if I was going to, you know, get slapped with handcuffs and go to jail that day or, you know, if I really didn't know. I was just trying to let it go with the flow or whatever. Had you ever been to court with someone else? No. So you get there. Did someone come with you? My mom. Okay, so she took off work and went with you. Mm -hmm. And what did you tell your employer? Um, well, I was supposed to have went to work. They had arrested me, so, you know, I told somebody to call and let them know what was going on, and, 
you know, when I got out, they was like, okay, well, after you go to court Monday, come in and we'll have a meeting and, you know, we'll talk about what's going on. So I, you know, I didn't, I didn't tell him no tale. I told him straight up what happened. And what did you was, tell him? I told him that, you know, I was what I was accused of, and he was like, well, you know, you know, we we kind of don't want people like that working for us. But you know, you say you're innocent. We believe you, but just to make sure that you know everything is okay, you know, we're gonna put you on suspension for now. And you know, when everything clears up, give us a call and you can come back to work. So how long had you worked there before that happened? I was at Papa John's on and off for uh, maybe five or six years. Did you like that job? Yes. Okay. And all right, so then you tell your employer the truth. That's good. Mm -hmm. They put you on suspension. You come to court. Now, what did you do about getting a lawyer? I mean, what was your thinking about that? Well, I really didn't have the money, so... You know, the first time I went, uh, the judge, I guess, reset it and was like, you know, come back with a lawyer the next time. And then the second time I came, I still didn't have a lawyer. Then uh, she was like, well, we're going to have to appoint you a lawyer. And that's when I started talking to you. Okay. And what did, how did you find that experience to be? I know you always have heard that court-appointed lawyers don't trust them, don't have them. How did you find that experience to be? Well, at first, I was like, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm going to go to jail because maybe she don't believe me or whatever. But then, you know, the more I talked to you and the more you gave me background about everything, I kind of started feeling a little better about everything. Like, you know, God will let everything work out. Okay. Um, so you went to court. This happened, uh, alleged to have happened August 11, 2010. And I'll just read the indictment um, as it was written. Uh, I'll give you a similar uh, view so you'll understand what a rape charge is like. It says that Michael Odoms uh, in Harris County intentionally and knowingly caused the sexual organ of Mary, a, a person younger than 17 years old, to contact the sexual organ of Michael uh, against the peace and dignity of the, of the state of Texas. And the process after that is on the first day, uh, the district attorney's office gets a file, they get the police report. They don't have the medical records yet. They don't have um, any of the police officers specific things like if they took a confession from someone or took a statement from someone and there's an audio or a video tape, they don't have, the DA doesn't have that. But they'll still generally um, make a plea bargain offer if they've talked to the victim and in this case it will be the victim, alleged victim and the victim's parents since the victim, uh, alleged victim in this case is a minor. So that's the procedure in a sexual assault case. And so usually after about the second court date, the d district attorney will make a plea bargain offer. They never offer probation, although because this is his first offense and it's a second degree felony in the state of Texas, um, they could have indicted it one of two ways. If it was a second degree felony, it was two to 20. What was I telling you? Was I telling you two to 20 or five to 99? No, five to 99. Five to 99. Okay, so since it was a child, it was five to 99. And so uh, it's a first-degree felony, and the DA's office doesn't offer probation on first-degree felonies. Uh, in fact, what was the first plea bargain offer they offered? 25 years. They, so they offered him 25 years in prison. And know this, because it's sexual assault of a child, had he pled guilty and accepted 25 years, he would have to stay in prison for 12 and a half years until he got until he was eligible to talk to anybody about parole. So if you looked in the computer and he'd accepted that, you'd see a parole eligibility date 12 and a half years later. That does not mean that's the day he gets out. That means that's the first opportunity he would have had to talk to someone in the parole board. So how did that make you feel when they offered you 25 years in prison and you've never oh. been in trouble, you've been working at Papa John's for years, uh, you live with friends, basically your uh, baby's mama's grandfather, right? Yes, ma'am. And um, in a household with a bunch of adults, and this is a teenage girl that you know very well, and she's saying that you raped her, and that now you see the DAs want you to do 25 years. How'd that make you feel? Oh, my heart dropped. I thought, you know, you know, the only thing I could think about was my kids. You know, I've missed the whole life, mm -hmm. the whole life. When I see them again, I'll be an old man, you know, and I don't know. It was just, it, it was hard. Did you feel defenseless, or did how, what? How did you feel about having to fight this system when you know it was your word against a, a, a teenager's word? Hmm. How did you feel you could fight it? 
Well, I mean, you know, I had people that was behind me 100%, and, you know, they knew that she, you know, was a consensual liar and, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that come out of her mouth was, you know, not true. And, you know, I kind of felt like I can beat it, you know, as long as I, you know, kept my head up and prayed every day, and that's what I did. How did you feel about the length of the process? Because it took a couple of years before the yeah. case was dismissed. How did you feel about that? It was stressful. It was very stressful. I mean, like, days before court, I couldn't sleep. I was up all night, maybe slept 30 minutes the whole night. And Were you thinking, like, the next tomorrow might be the day I go to jail? Yes. Yes. Did you ever expect that I was going to say, oh, I don't believe you, Michael, you got to go and take this time? Did you ever think I was going to do that? Well, after talking to you for a while, no, I didn't. Because I, I felt like you was behind me 100%. Okay. Hold on just a minute. We have a call. Caller, you're on. Uh, how you doing, Miss Vivian K? Hey, how are you, Tracy? Y'all doing pretty good. And uh, it, it's good talking to you again. Thank you. And, uh, you know, all I, I want to say about this uh, situation is it, it, it's very sad. You know, the, the worst thing can happen to a man, you know, be accused of you know, something like that, and you really didn't do it. I, I agree. I agree, Tracy, um, and uh, that's why we want to talk about it, to let people know there's two sides to every story. Yeah, and, and I want to, uh, you know, thank Michael for coming on and, and uh, you know, telling your story, because, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, you're stepping up, and, uh, you know, you, you might help other people, and, you know, that, that's what they're sure designed for. Right, it is, Tracy. Thank you so much for calling, and thank you for being my number one fan. Okay, baby. You, you know, I love you. Thank you, too. Thank you. So let me uh, switch to my investigator. She's sitting up here chomping at the bit, so we're going to let her say something. Uh, one of the things that I do, uh, if it's court appointed, and I wasn't doing court appointments at the time, so Michael almost just had like a divine intervention. I just happened to be in that court that day on a case, and the judge said, Miss King, this is the kind of case you'd like. This guy said he didn't do it. Would you want to take this case? He actually gave me two cases that day. I think a murder case and that Cameron Coker. So Cameron Coker and Michael, uh, Michael Odom. <laughs> On, this, on the same day, and I was like, well, I don't normally do it, but okay, if you want me to. Uh, I have to admit, I was being a little bit greedy, because Cameron, she said, well, the Cameron Coker case is going to be on TV, uh, because it was on First 48, so his lawyer that he's had for a year has gotten off of that case, so uh, would you take it, because the trial's going to be on TV, so being a media hog, I did accept that case, and so I couldn't say no once she said, okay, I have another case, too, not on TV, but he needs a lawyer, so I, I had to take it. Uh, but anyway, you have, if, you, if it's court appointed, you have to get a, a, file a motion with the court to ask for a, uh, an investigator. And they only give us up to $750. 600 Okay, well, at the time, it was, I thought it was $750 two years ago. And um, you had to um, file a motion first, get that approved. And so I always use Sonia Rafit. Now... If in the real world, if I hire her, we, I try to pay her more than that, and, uh, you know, she can make generally $1,200 or $2,500. Um, I see there's another call, so I'm going to take this call before I, I switch it over to, uh, to uh, Sonia. Uh, Caller, you're on. Please turn your volume down and talk directly into the telephone. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when, I, when I pleaded my case, uh, the judge, uh, with the instruction, the judge gave me that if I completed all of my uh, deferred adjudication uh, responsibilities, uh, if I stay out of trouble, that they would clear, that, uh, they would expose my record. But in consulting with another attorney, they said because it involved with a child, uh, that they would not be able to expose it. I was wondering, would the judge say something that she knew already was incorrect or not? I can't speak for another person, sir. That's all I can tell you. I can't oh. speak for them. I mean, you know, that would be like you speaking for me. I couldn't speak for them. A judge should not oh. lie to you. Uh, it, was it in Harris County? That's yes, wrong. Who was the judge? Uh, it's been a while. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, Ms. Brown, uh, judge Brown, I think. No, uh, they shouldn't lie. To, a judge should not lie to you, and so I'm sorry that that happened. Okay, thank you. But if you ever want to tell your story, you're welcome to call me at my office. My office number will flash at the end, and you can always Google me, Vivian R. King, uh, or just look me up, and my number will come up. Uh, but you can call my office and, and make a, a date to come tell your story if you like. What if I'm interested in hiring you? <laughs> I'm not interested in that right now. This is public access. Anything that I do okay. in my personal life, uh, my personal business, you have to call my office. Um, all right, thank you. All right. Um, anyway, 
let's talk about your situation. Um, now, um, okay, so we get a, a court-appointed lawyer, which we know is not enough money, but uh, because in this case, Michael had about, uh, yeah, you had about 15 people we needed to talk to. There was a household of about eight adults, and uh, then there were, this, it's a very sordid family tree, so a lot of people had information on the complainant. And one of the things as a lawyer that you do is you first try to ask your client, why would this child lie on you? What would be the reason? You know, I believe what you're saying, but kids just don't talk about a person putting their sexual organ inside of their sexual organ and using the street vernacular that's being used if it didn't happen. Kids have to either been, either it did happen or the kid has been exposed to sex, they've been watching pornography, they're looking at it on the internet, they're looking at nasty magazines, they're listening to people's conversation, they're watching videos, they're having sex, they are in school with other kids who've told of accusing people of rape and how they've gotten out of trouble by doing it. Uh, there are a lot of foster kids that go to mainstream schools and many foster kids and kids from disruptive families have been sexually assaulted and they can tell a child what will happen. I mean, they know that they're going to, uh, the, the focus will be taken from the child to the adult. So if the child gets in trouble for something, a lot of teenagers who get in trouble for things, if they've been, had a bad and troubled life, where the government, like foster care, has been in their life, they'll resort to, oh, well, I was raped, because then they immediately get the sympathy. They could have been smoking dope or stealing or having fights, but if they start saying that somebody raped them, then the attention first goes to cuddle and comfort, which is our natural reaction in society, and to get the bad guy. And a lot of times the kids will just say a name because they're not thinking about what the consequences can be. They have no idea that that's about to completely disrupt this man's life. They're just thinking about getting out of trouble. And uh, generally, but kids know, once you start lying, you have to stick to it. And so a lot of times it becomes very complicated. So to investigate a case like this, as a lawyer, I, I have an extensive interview with my client, with my client's family, like his mother came to court with him all the time, and then start getting the tele names and telephone numbers of all the witnesses or persons that were in the household with him. How close are the rooms together? You snore real bad. Does everybody hear you? Would people know that the child was in the room? Did she come in your room a lot? Did y'all do anything, other bad things together? Uh, is there some things that you are ashamed of? And my tactics in a, in a case is, if my client is doing something wrong, I'm going to be admit, I'm going to be honest about it. They could be doing something wrong, but it's not raping this child. And so there were some things going on in this family and in the dynamics that we won't, we don't really want to talk about, but let's just say there's drinking going on. There's, 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 let's just say that there's alcohol being passed and people know that this child drinks alcohol, and some of the adults, including Michael, have allowed her to drink alcohol, have even given her alcohol, have even shared alcohol with him. But at some point, uh, Michael says, we grew up, we decided, I'm going to stop doing this. This is wrong. I shouldn't be giving this teenager alcohol, and so I'm going to stop doing this. I shouldn't be drinking with this child, and so maybe she got mad at me because I stopped doing what she asked me to do. So I, I get all of this uh, background information and I give it to my investigator and say, look, you now got to go talk to all of these witnesses. You've got to, this is what the police report says. This is what Michael says. Find out what the truth is and what all these people's opinions are. So I'm going to switch this to uh, Sonia and tell me, Sonia Rafid, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Sonia Rafid. I'm the owner of Research World Investigations, Research World Unlimited. So tell us a little bit about um, how long it takes to become a private investigator licensed by the state of Texas? In Texas, there are several ways that you can become licensed. One of the first ways is to work for a company, be a registrant, or work for a company for three years. Another way is to have a college degree in criminal justice, and that'll take away two years, and then you'll have to work for a company for a year. Um, I'm sorry, with a college degree. If you have a criminal justice degree, that allows you to be able to go and sit for the state test. And then there's a uh, program uh, from the University of North Texas called their Professional Development Institute that it's about a five-month program. If you take that program, because it's such an inclusive program, it will allow you to go and sit and take, for the, uh, take the state test immediately after the completion of the program. Okay. And do you take the test in Austin or in Houston? In Austin. Okay. So how long have you been licensed? I've been licensed with my own company since 1993. Oh, okay. 
Good, almost 20 years. And uh, so tell us about uh, Michael's case and, and the approach that you took to uh, help us uh, solve this riddle. One of the first things that we do on any investigation, we first do backgrounds of all parties involved, including our client and all of the witnesses before we leave our office to go and talk with them because we have to determine some way of knowing their truth and veracity or knowing how familiar they are with the criminal justice system or knowing if they're sue crazy or just trying to figure out some things that they have going on in their life. Uh, oftentimes nowadays we will do social network searches and things just to get an idea of if you know their social network is showing excessive drug use you know, that may encourage us to do morning interviews as opposed to afternoon interviews. So we do the backgrounds first, and then we, um, we typically, for all of the complainants, all of the victims or alleged victims in our case, we always, always requirement do an in-person interview. Uh, in this particular case, because there were so many different witnesses, we all were done in person. Uh, and plus, in person are better interviews because you can tell if a person has been more truthful with you, whether they are, you can read their body language, you don't have to risk them just slamming the phone down in your ear and blocking your number forever. So at my company we do in-person interviews. Okay, and were you able to talk to the persons involved in this case? We did. We, we had to do many different attempts because some days you catch some people at home, some days you would catch no people at home on this case, but we eventually was able to talk with many of the people in person and after the third attempt then we will try to uh, talk to them on the phone and we'll leave a note before we um, resort to making a phone call we'll leave a happy f a note and ask them to give us a call and if they give us a, it is just a nondescript note saying hi give us a call and maybe put a happy face on it and ask them to call us back and when they call us back then we identify who we are and the nature of our call so in this case did you talk to all of the people who were in the household when this alleged uh, rape occurred. Yes. And what did you and, and what did they say? What was the general consensus? The general consensus was shock, surprise that well, I'm sorry, not shock that Mary was making an allegation, but shock that Mary would make an allegation about Michael because you know, everyone is so it's such a family household, but the persons that were in the house, the rooms were about three feet apart in, across a three-foot hall. It's a small house, even though uh, it's a four-bedroom house, the three bedrooms are down one hall. The fourth bedroom is actually a converted garage. So it's on the other side of the house, and it's separate from where this alleged incident was alleged to have occurred. Uh, there, it's a three-bedroom house, a small house. Uh, you go down the hall, you turn. When you enter the living room, if you go to the hall, you can turn right or left. Right was the grandfather's bedroom, left, was the bathroom, or more directly in front of you was the bathroom, and then to the left was two bedrooms directly across from each other uh, with a three-foot hall separating them, paper-thin walls. You could hear the TV, you could hear a fart. It was, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm very serious because I went to the home, I took photos. Uh, the owner of the home was, allowed me to do as many photos, measurements, and things that we wanted. And we actually did the burp test, and you know, just to see if you could you know, see how much you could hear, turn the volume up, have the TV on regular. You can hear everything because it's really a small house. Let me uh, hold that thought, and let's take a call. Uh, caller, you're, you're on. Hello? Hello, Vivian. Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering, why I am not hearing anything about DNA? Um, we haven't gotten there yet. Oh. <laughs> um. uh, unfortunately, as a lawyer, I think chronologically, and this case went on for two years, and it wasn't until like the third or fourth time it was set for trial that, and we got a whole new crop of DAs, that they said, oh, my goodness, oh, we found some DNA. We got it tested. So they kept asking for resets. Um, the allegation was that um, Michael ra raped Mary in his bedroom and he used, he ejaculated, he, didn't, he did not use a condom and he ejaculated into a sock. Uh, that was what her allegation was. And with did you say sock? Sock, S-O-C-K. Into his, okay. He ejaculated into his socks. 
And so the okay. when the police came, uh, they took all the bedding off the bed. They took socks. They took every, they took all his clothes. They took everything. And but nobody wanted to talk about um, DNA until we got this last crop of, of uh, prosecutors. And they said, oops, we found DNA. We were ready for trial on three different occasions, I think, mm -hmm. never knowing anything about DNA. Uh, and when they sent it off to, for the DNA to be tested, there was, there was none. That's because uh, if the DNA had supported their case, you would have heard about it a long time ago. Right. Yeah, so these it. prosecutors... That's when you don't hear about the evidence. Right. That's when, when it doesn't suit their purpose. Exactly. So there was um, no DNA. No DNA came back in the sock or any of the bedding material. They tried to say it was transferred and DNA. And then they tried to say it was transferred DNA, but there was, there was no DNA that came back from the lab. Um, another thing, um, okay, so you have another question? Um, well, I mean, was it, did she not also claim intercourse, she said? Oh, definitely, sexual intercourse with no condom. Okay, um, but that allegation came too late. Well, actually, so. what she did was, uh, she, she got a rape kit done, and it was done two days after the alleged uh, rape occurred. Uh, and there were no anal tears or vaginal tears. Uh, what she was complaining of was uh, it hurt when she peed. That's what I think. That's what it said. And she oh. said it hurt. She said she. They said, they said she had multiple bruises, scarring from self mutilation, and she said that it, it it burned when she peed. So that was something to cause the hospital staff to be alarmed. And I I do have the medical records here. Uh, one of the things that uh, bothered me in the case, and what I had to have my investigator talk about, is that. She told the story differently from what she told the nurses, allegedly, two days later when they did the rape kit at the hospital. And then um, that same time, she also was taken to the Children's Assessment Center to do a video. And she tells the story much differently um, in those two cases. So uh, keep listening. Well, keep keep listening. Me to my advice to, to Michael, um, I had a, a trial sim uh, you know, similar uh, with the... Uh, my kids are changing exactly. Every time he told a statement, it was a little bit different. And my jurors, even though I did end up having to take a deal because of the hung jury, they they recognized the truth um, and they recognized the, the, the lies from when they happen, and they'll recognize the truth from you if it's um, you know decided that you should testify. Um, which I believe that you should. Oh, I, they dismissed I it. I hadn't to told you the end. And it's very, uh, it's very apparent to me. Okay, keep listening and call us back. Okay, let us tell a little bit more of the story. But you're welcome to call us back in about, call back in about ten or fifteen minutes if you have another comment. Okay. All right. Thanks, Vivian. Thank you. Okay, good luck, Michael. Thank you. One of the things I want to add is that Michael's case was dismissed. Okay, it was set for trial for about a year, and when the DNA didn't come back. Uh, and different other stories uh, that we told them. I brought my witnesses in. After Sonia did her investigation and spoke with all the witnesses, I actually, we brought them into court on one of the trial dates and let the prosecutors interview all of them. And let's talk a little bit more, Sonia, about, but in the end, Michael's case was dismissed, so it's over. He was going to testify, but the case is over. Um, in this case, the um, father of Mary allowed me to interview her directly. And it was very apparent to me that she may have been role playing or something when I interviewed her because the interview took place at the grandfather's house in Michael's old room where this allegation was alleged to have happened and the same bedding bed was there and we were sitting on the bed and there was it was just like she's sitting talking to me today, it's like, oh yeah, and it was right here, and, and so-and-so was across the hall, and it was just zero emotion. What she said to me that day was apples and oranges, extremely different than what she had said to the Children's Assessment Center, to the uh, Pasadena Police Department. And when I would ask her about that, she said, oh, they must have gotten it wrong, or she would have some comeback but I wanted to make sure I was truly talking to the correct person because it was such a different story. And I'm interviewing her about one year after the allegation. Talk about the other people who were in the household. Like, because one of, let me tell you what one of the allegations that I want you to speak to 
uh, when she's on, when she goes and gets the rape kit, she basically uh, says that uh, Mike had forced himself on, on her and that um, she also says that it had happened on August 11th and continued until August 17th with multiple encounters. So she said it went on for a week. She said no condom was used. Uh, it occurred when she and Michael were uh, drinking alcohol in his bedroom, and he got very aggressive and slapped her on the face and held her by her throat with a rag to prevent his fingertips, fingerprints from showing. And she said she was drunk or high, at the time, and she believes that he did this because he knows that she will succumb easily to pressure when she's high. And she also reports uh, being a victim of a sexual abuse by another known uh, perpetrator. Now, but when she goes to the Children's Assessment Center and she tells the story longer, she talks about one of the other adults in the house has a baby and that the adult left her to babysit this baby and that's when Mike came into the bedroom, and he had his boxers on, but he still had sexual intercourse with her. He put his feet in her chest. He, uh, she pushed him off. He hit the wall. Uh, uh, they basically started fighting uh, over her clothes when Clear she tried down. to rape him. And, like, they were going back and forth, and the kid, uh, the kid that she was babysitting woke up crying, and, and, and Mike ran out of the room. So she went into this long thing about how this baby was there. That was one of the other killers in this case, because when um, Sonia interviewed uh, the, the female in the house of the baby, uh, tell us what she said. She said never has she left her child in Mary's custody, and never would that have happened. And another thing is, Michael told us she would have never left her baby with her. So. The thing, so when you investigate a case like this, you have to see things that Michael was saying were coming out to be more true than anything that the uh, alleged victim Mary had said. Because he said, no, she mm -hmm. wouldn't have left that child Never. with her because she's not a responsible teenager. She's old enough to babysit, but she's not responsible. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's talk Correct. again about that. The, the mother of the child was stating, for one, that if her child was there, she was there. Right. And that the child was young enough for her to take wherever she went, so she would have never left the child there. But the mother of that child just went like, please, you don't believe her. And she didn't believe the allegation at all from the beginning, from day one. And let's also talk about another variable. Michael also told us that this child had falsely accused um, her cousin of raping her. He, she had uh, falsely done a, a false Amber Alert. Correct. Uh, because they were in trouble for coming home late or something. They stealing from the mall. Stealing they, they, from they were stealing from the mall. Mm -hmm. She and another cousin were stealing from the mall. So uh, tell us about that, Michael. Well, this was like before I even, you know, right before I, you know, started dating my baby's mom. And, uh, Which is her cousin. Yes, ma'am. Well, cousin slash stepsister, however it goes. Um, uh, and it was told that they was at the mall, uh, one of the kids, one, whoever she was with, they got caught. And um, something about she ran to the parking lot, she was running home or something, and some guys in a, in a van or some kind of SUV picked up and took off. And they called and made an Amber Alert about that, and she was at home the whole time. Trying to kidnap her. And so she was lying, playing like someone tried to kidnap her to mm -hmm. try to get out of trouble because she'd been at the mall stealing. stealing. Correct. And then she'd also accused her cousin um, of raping her. Yes, ma'am. And he was another kid. Uh, what was that yes, all about? That one, I really didn't get the detail. I just heard, you know, the hearsay okay. about that one. Hold on just a moment. Okay. Go ahead. I, with reference to uh, her cousin who was alleged to have raped her, she had actually said that she was pregnant for that cousin. Oh, okay. And I was able to interview that cousin, the cousin's mother, and it was like, are you kidding me? And if, you know, so if she were pregnant, what happened to the child? But at the time, that cousin was not living in Texas when she was saying this happened. Um, another thing with the uh, Amber Alert, one thing that we do when we're doing our investigation, we do listen to our clients and we hear what they have to say, but we verify everything. So with the Amber Alert, we pull documentation to support that allegation, which included the police report from the Pasadena Police Department, from the Amber Alert people, which is a nationwide um, 
organization to um, see who they actually listed as the person making the allegations and things and Mary was the person and I interviewed the at the time girlfriend of Mary's dad and she told how Mary came home just crying 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 and you know putting on a just you would not not believe her until they played back the video at the mall and that was one of the indicators that it didn't happen because the mall has surveillance cameras all around okay so basically she lied so well that the family thought she had really been kidnapped from the mall and found out from the surveillance cameras that she hadn't been kidnapped at all so that's uh, and, and the prosecutors knew this all along because as I was getting this information we were sharing it with them um, and in that situation she stated that the um, Mary is a Caucasian female and in that altercation at the mall she stated it was some black males driving a dark colored SUV with you know rims and she just and gave a partial license plate just very trying to make it incredibly believable so were you able to verify anything with Amber Alert sure we verified that um, that the Amber Alert was truly called in uh, but it was it was canceled in a matter of hours when they start reviewing the mall surveillance camera to see if they could see if the persons that were alleged to have been trying to kidnap them had been shopping in the mall so that they could get a good picture of them. And I mean, they even went to say the license plate was B12 or you know, something just partial license plate, but uh, that was also suspect to me when I'm reading the information because it was a SUV and the license plates are different than on a vehicle. So, so basically that was found to be a false allegation also. Correct. We have another call. Caller, you're on. Thanks for calling. Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Why did the prosecutors not take the time to look into this in detail? Sir, that's a very good question. Uh, I've had a good reputation for being a very good lawyer, and it's because I go into the details. Um, if you ever look at my website, VivianRKing.com, uh, see some of my victories. I think it's posted through 2010. Um, people say, well, you know, she's a good lawyer, she's a good lawyer, but it's because I take the time to look at the details, and uh, which is very costly. So a lot of times people don't want to hire me, but um, I do go into the details. I, that's a very good question, and I wish that they would, because well, it totally disrupts somebody's life. I mean, he lost his job, <coughs> um, he's never been able to get that job back, and that always happens in these situations. I mean, his whole life was changed and ruined. Yes, but the, the, the problem might be even more deeper than that. Is there not mu put enough money put into the system to where they can take the time into it? Well, this is the problem, though. But if you're going to disrupt somebody's life, you need to take time into it. That's why our Constitution was written, so that wouldn't happen. So there could be, I mean, why could, if they took two months to investigate it, why didn't they take six months to investigate it? If he truly raped her, why did it they, st he's still living in the same household with her family. She's still coming in every day for two months. Nobody's stopping that. So... I mean, they should have been asking those kind of questions. By the time he was arrested, the police should have interviewed the household again and said, well, what's been going on? But instead, they just come slam him up and arrest him. Uh, there's a problem systematically, I think, because um, the media portrays things so awfully that it's arrest first, investigate later. Because we certainly have the money. We have the money. We have thousands of cops. They have the resources to do all of this beforehand. So uh, I was a prosecutor. I've been a defense lawyer. And eventually it, it happens. I mean, so they, you know, so I think that people, they just believe the child. And we don't have enough safeguards, and we don't have a system that's fair enough to look at both sides first to see the immediacy. Because don't you think that those police should have interviewed everybody in the household uh, the same night that they took him to jail? I mean, they, they interviewed him, but they didn't end up try to find out who was in the house and interview all of them. Uh, they interviewed him. He said he didn't do it. And then two months later, there's, a, a, there's a, an arrest warrant, and they take him to jail. So um, I think that that's a fault in the system. Okay, well, I agree with you on that. So you don't think it's money? No, I don't think it's money because they always still spend the money. I mean, just think about this, sir. Money is still being spent every day. I mean, prosecutors are getting paid every day. Cops are getting paid every day, whether they take vacation, whether they work on this case, whether they work on another case. I mean, people, the money is being expended every day. We have a full-time DNA lab that was just waiting to do the DNA, but the prosecutor had to send it there. It's because the system gets to beat on the defenseless. I mean, he doesn't have any money. He's poor. So what can they do if they just 
that you, don't you think it costs the system more when you reset a case for two years? I mean, that, that, that's, that's, yeah, yeah. that's resources that us as taxpayers are paying. We're paying every day to keep that Harris County jail open, to keep the county courthouse open, to keep the judges, everybody paid in there. I mean, it's happening every day. So to me, um, we don't have a good account a system that's accountable. When, uh, okay, have, when our elected well, officials yeah, are only yeah. elected once every four years, then they can do whatever they want to. And who, like, if you have a job, you have a supervisor. When I had a job, I had a supervisor. Who is the supervisor of the DA? The office, other than the taxpayers that have to vote every year. And if you don't know what's going on, how would you know? I mean, one of the reasons why I started this show is because I get five or ten to ten calls a, a week with people saying of how they were mistreated in the system. And I said, I can't help you, ma'am, that that happened, that your son's in prison yep. for something. Okay, when you, say, when you say elected officials, who exactly are you, are you speaking of? The district the, attorney? The or district or attorney who? is elected. The judges are elected. The mayor, okay. uh, mayor is elected who hires the police chief. The sheriff is elected. Uh, this was a sheriff. This was Pasadena P P mm -hmm. PD. So uh, those people are the, the Pasadena uh, City Council is elected, and they uh, choose a, a, a police chief. So and if you call and complain, they just won't do anything. But okay, so there so there are many people who could have been more involved. Absolutely, many people if they had a real voice. If they had a real voice. So say if the person was from River Oaks or somebody who knows how to call the media. They could, uh, they'd probably listen to him. But Michael's poor. He doesn't know. He he can barely uh, afford to get to the courthouse to pay the okay, well, who, who does have a real voice and should have done something? To me, who should have done uh, something is the DA. The, the police should have done it before he was arrested. They should have interviewed okay. everybody in the house. And if they'd have interviewed everybody in the house, they would have found out that this little girl has made many false allegations. They would have found out about the Amber Alert. They didn't know about that. They had, yeah. they, uh, the DAs had to investigate after the fact, after I investigated what my client told me, because I'm not going to go tell the DAs anything okay. if uh, my client is lying to me, because I want to I wanna be believable. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So it took me so several my point, months. My, my point is that the DA should be ultimately responsible. They're ultimately responsible, and they did the right thing. They dismissed the case, but it was two years later. Eventually, yes. Eventually. eventually. They eventually, when I got an honest crop of DAs, I had to switch DAs two or three what? times. Mm -hmm. Two, three, th three times, but the last group that was in there was a very honest group. They worked hard to get it done. They wanted to make sure before they dismissed it uh, that that DNA did not come back to him. But they had, I'd already revealed all of the lies we found. But the police should have found that out. Our police do a lot of poor investigation when it comes to poor people. They should have talked to everybody in that house. They should have known that this child did Amber Alerts. And, and all they have to do, it takes, it's hard for us to get information. We have to subpoena it. They can just go on the computer because they have access to the Amber system. You see what I'm saying? They could have gone, the little girl had falsely accused her, her cousin. If they had interviewed her and asked her that, or at, interviewed the people in the family, they would have told them, and they could have gone and seen those records of that. Well, well, well but that's they didn't another do it. issue. That, yeah, yeah, that's another issue. They are not being cooperative. So this that's family, what it sounds to me like. No, this, this family was cooperative. No, I'm not talking about the family. I'm oh. talking about the, the people responsible for causing the problem, like the DA and everyone. Right, yeah, right. They're just slow to do anything. It, you're guilty until proven innocent, basically. Once the DA's position is that you're guilty until proven innocent, so they don't investigate it because they feel like the police should have investigated it, which is true. So I think the fault here lies with the police department. I think the police officer should have interviewed everybody. But it's kind of the DA's, too, because they call the DA's office to accept charges. The DA's just Absolutely. accept them, and they don't... They don't question them enough about who was there. Like this deep investigation that I did should have been done at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean the child couldn't be raped because she's sure. uh, made allegations before. But wouldn't you want to know that before you start disrupting somebody's life? Because sometimes children, can, teenagers can take polygraphs. This case was so serious, sir, that when the Children's Assessment Center did her video, it's available for the defense lawyers to see. The little girl started talking about having sex with another little girl, which was a minor, which is illegal. So then they had to, investi the, then they had to investigate that to see if they were going to charge their victim with sexually assaulting another girl. And she was, so she was talking about sleeping with another girl in front of her family. So this case was crazy. But the police didn't, was, yeah. the cra the police didn't investigate that. Um, yeah, okay. That was happening at uh, the Children's Assessment Center, which is in West University, which is uh, it's also run by the government, but they're more trained uh, nurses and forensic people that know how to take interviews, and basically more like CPS. 
They're kind of more like well, a, an arm like this. Well, 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 I agree with you. It was totally messed up. My point was I just wanted to bring out the, uh, who was actually should have been responsible for it, and that needs to be pointed out. That's, that, that, that's just what I want to be. Yeah, and you did a good job of pointing out. that out. I believe it was the police. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling. Don't you agree? Do you think it was the police? Yes, ma'am. What do you think? Could be a lot more. Correct. I agree. And this uh, Mary is very well known in the Pasadena area and in the Pasadena system. There were numerous, numerous times that she made false allegations that made reports calling the police saying people had done um, one of her friend's father beat her with a belt and um, they went to you know talk to the guy and the guy's like, well, I was at work. And things, so it it was so. So much. ultimately, what you're saying is she lied about getting beat with the belt at a friend's house. Oh, there was. Now, how did minutes. you find this out? Did you do a, a Did you get a report of all of the allegations that we, she made? We did. We um, we asked for the the time she was the suspect victim or um, was the suspect victim or witness witness, and I believe there was over 37. So look and listen to what Sonia's saying. She found 37 allegations, and that's what she did, an open records request to the Pasadena police Correct. at giving the child's name and saying, give me every police report, run it in your system, where this child was either the victim of a crime, the uh, witness. witness to a crime, or the defendant in a crime. And she got 37 police reports in the, in the up open record. So, so, sir, I think that helps answer your question. The police should have done it. They should have known that. And put that uh, and given that information to the DA when they were talking to them about whether or not to accept charges. Uh, let me take another call. Caller, thank you for calling Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Hello, Miss Vivian. How are you doing? This is Miss Roger Victoria again. Hey, Victoria. I listen to you show all the time. You got a very good topic on because I think a lot of things was going on. The seat, uh, the seat, uh, a lot of things would be investigated with the seat with with, with the. Uh, different investigator because, not the investigator, the, um... Police? The police department because a lot of times they just sit up and don't do their jobs. And all they want to do is see, like you say, a poor man or a poor person that's less offensive. And then when they see these cases, they should realize that look into stuff before they start hammering on people doing interrupting people's lives. Because my daughter's in this, uh, my goddaughter's in this mess because her daughter said her son did something to her, which one true took us five years to get out of this mess. And they still giving us problems. The same the girl is still lying. The, uh, the, 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 the people with that working with the, with the uh, what you call these people, the CPA, what you, what you call CP, A Child Protective Services, CPS. Child Protective Center, they are a bunch of jokes. They lied when they go to court. And they just said they lied to the, look into the system. They believe everything about a psychological child by the child. If a child needs a problem, they want to keep us in the parents and parents and people over and over to different things until they get, they never get their paperwork right. Yes, I understand. They don't, they don't do their paperwork right, and then when you own them, they, they, they just, they, they, something needs to be done about the system, which is with them. Because okay. they just lie on family people and their emotions at the black people. is messing with a lot of people. is messing their families up. And our black boys cannot cry for this when everybody looking at them as a sore eye. L let me just make a suggestion to you, ma'am. I understand and I feel your pain. Your, your telephone call are the type of calls I get every, every weekend. I love you, and I love my community. It wears me out, because I hear it all day, every day, complaints about a system. Um, I think you should also always call your state representative. You should always call your, because state representatives in Austin are the ones who do the funding for the trial protective services, because they're under the arm of the Texas Family Rehabilitation System. Family. Uh -huh. And so talk to your, if you, is your state rep, uh, maybe Sylvester Turner or Harold Dutton or... Garnett Coleman, you should also always, when you have a problem, call them, call your city council person, call your state senator, and complain about what's going on because they are the ones who fund these agencies, and they need to know that there needs to be some oversight involved because they do get audited periodically, 
Um, so that's all I can tell you. Otherwise, I can just tell you, God bless you, and try to work with if you have a court-appointed lawyer in the in the CPS no, system. That's already over with. We okay. don't went through that. Now we've gone through another problem with her. She just, what I'm saying, the young girls and young girls' children are having problems. Then you see where these child is starting to line problems at early. There's something is wrong when a child just start a line to have their way of Yes, ma'am. We have four minutes, so we're going to wrap it up. Okay, I sure. Talk to you later. Thank you so much for calling, and call us next week, okay? I will, dog. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, yeah, that's one of the things. We have about three minutes, so we're going to start wrapping it up. So um, let's, uh, I'm going to give you one minute to say a final uh, closing comment. This one hour went by fast. I guess we could have yeah. we could have done a two-hour show tonight because <laughs> um, we never got to talk about a couple of topics that I want to talk about, like how, why people might give a false confession um, and, and different things like that. But anyway, so give us your wrap up. Well, I'm just happy to be on the other side of the wall right now. Okay. And although this is still on your record because it has not been expunged, mm -hmm. um, but it was dismissed, uh, has that affected you in trying to get any jobs? Not yet that I know of. Um, I tried to go, well, right now I'm in the process of moving from one apartment to another apartment, and the first thing, that's the first thing that popped up. And she, the lady asked me about it. She, you know, gave me the third degree about it. And I was like, well, you see it on the paper. It says dismissed. You know, it wasn't true. And she was like, well, let me see what I can do. Let me talk to my supervisor or whatever. And, you know, we'll give you a call tomorrow about the apartment. So, I mean, so you still so, don't know so if they're going to give you the apartment? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's the only thing so far. So, okay. So, because apartments do background checks, so he's still waiting on that. Uh, Sonia, let me get a last uh, one-minute wrap-up from you, please. Well, I would suggest that if a person has a criminal charge against them, that they consider hiring an investigator to assist with the fact, the interviews, the gathering of the records, and just, you know, helping them to have justice prevail. Okay. Um, and the closing comments I think I want to make, because uh, the moral to the story is that you have to have a lawyer that you're comfortable with. You're at the mercy of the court if you have to get a court-appointed lawyer because you cannot have the court-appointed lawyer of your choice. Uh, you have to take who you get. But the one thing I always tell people is if you didn't do it, don't plead guilty. So it doesn't matter if you have a good or bad lawyer. The lawyer has a duty to tell you what the DAs are offering you, if it's 25 years or whatever. But if you didn't do it, you stick to your convictions. Parents, if you're watching this show and your children didn't do it, I don't care if they have a court-appointed lawyer. Court-appointed lawyers go to trial, too, and some of them and us are the best in the city, really. Um, and so, and, and, but you have to make people do their job uh, because a lot of court-appointed lawyers believe that people are, are guilty until proven innocent, too, uh, unless you hold their feet to the fire. And then they'll fight for you in the end. But if you're interviewing a lawyer, always interview at least five lawyers. Try to talk to lawyers about their philosophy, how they approach cases, and uh, hire the best lawyer that you can afford. Because you have to understand, once you're in this system, you'll never get out. So if, if you have the opportunity to get a loan or sell something, it's your life, and it's going to affect you for the rest of your life. And so you really need to get out there and make sure you have good representation because uh, a criminal charge can come in many different ways. Uh, once again, I, I'm going to thank Michael for having the courage to uh, tell his story. Uh, to the Houston public so we'd have an opportunity to, to debate the issues that happen with our Harris County criminal uh, justice system. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for telling us what an investigator does. And uh, thank you for watching this show, watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. This is my one-year anniversary. I started doing this uh, the week after Thanksgiving last year. It's been a very uh, pleasant experience. Hopefully, I've taught you a lot. You've taught me a lot by calling. And it, remember, I want to tell your story. If you have any topics you want to talk to me about, call me at my office. Schedule a Wednesday night to come tell your story. This is your community, and I want to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in again tonight. We have something really good, a hot topic on the news this week. We've been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate real, real stories.